used to devil worshippers used to be real secretive oh, like yeah. going down in the basement this yeah. assalamu alaikum greens of peace welcome to the dean shaw media your host we have a lot to talk about tyrese it's yeah. all god right because you know we're, we should as believers we should go the rest of our life trying to figure out god that should be an everlasting hunt i just feel like we're in competition right now because they are trying to normalize the devil. They are trying to populate. The devil is, is on the main stage at award shows. And in every video and yeah, man. signs and symbols. Just pearly. And that's where I began my journey. But I always had a very healthy respect for Islam because I understand that to a degree. We know there are many benefits to the use of black seed. That's why I use the black seed by Tesneen. Use promo code the Dean Show for 15% off. Indonesia. And all of this, we're going to get into it with my next guest. We have one God who's named Allah, Allah. And his final message is Muhammad Peace be upon him This is our religion, Islam, Islam This is the Deen Show Do I love you, Marasha? All the work that you're doing When I was ready to talk about it, I would only talk to yes And I was explaining how much respect I have for the faith of Islam Welcome to the Deen Show The Deen Show Man, how are you? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to everybody out there, all the believers. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Now, what did you say for many people tuning in? They're like, we want to hear what these Muslims have to say, but <laughs> now we got to take an Arabic class. This is the greeting of peace. We say, Assalam, the peace, alaikum, upon you, wa rahmatullah, and the mercy of God. Some would consider you a Bible scholar because you spent a lot of time. <laughs> And you got your, actually your Bible right there. I do, yeah. What was the greeting of Jesus? How would he say it in Aramaic or in the Hebrew? Well, I mean, How you would translate it. Yeah, you will find the same greeting. Uh, even amongst Jews today, you will find Shalom and you will find uh, Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him. We love him as the prophet of God. We respect him. And he had the same greetings. And you will find him also praying, as those that are interested, as you see Muslims praying. You will see Abraham and Moses all using the similar greetings of peace upon the believers and praying in the same way that the Muslims pray today. Unpackage that for us. Now, for, pe for some people hearing that for the first time, you said, we love Jesus. Yes. W what does that mean? We love Jesus. I mean, for us... How can as a Muslim, people are thinking, come on now, what are you guys just trying to like, you know, win favors with us, with the <laughs> Christians? Uh, what do you mean you love yeah, Jesus? We to don't hear a Muslim to... now say we love Jesus. What That's are... wonderful to... Uh, and explain because for us as Muslims we're not trying to win favors from anybody we have God that's enough for us but the fact of the matter is that in our religion of Islam we love all the prophets Abraham Moses David Jesus Muhammad peace and blessings be upon all of them you will never see a Muslim burning pictures of Jesus even though we don't agree with making pictures of prophets you will not see a Muslim burning even the Bible you will not see a Muslim making disrespectful cartoons of Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him. In fact, when non-Muslims, when, when atheists disrespect Jesus by making caricatures, Muslims are the ones that get upset more than Christians. Because we love Jesus. We love Moses. We love Abraham. We love Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon all of them. Just like when we say the name of our prophet Muhammad, we say the name of our Prophet Jesus and say peace and blessings be upon him. Allah, the God, the Creator who inspired the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is the same Allah that Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him, was sent by with his command. And this you can find in the Bible. If you look in the Bible, if you're a Christian, you can follow with me and you can open up to... John 12 49 in the Bible John 12 49 it says for I according to the Christian Bible this is the King James Version New King James Version 12 49 in the Bible John 12 49 it says for I 
according to the Christian Bible, this is the King James Version, New King James Version, for I have not spoken on my own authority. According to the Bible, Jesus is saying that I don't speak on my own authority. But the Father who sent me gave me a command. John 20, 17. This is John 12, 49. 49, John 12, 49. And we'll continue into 50. So John, if you're watching and you're Christian, open up your Bible. Take a look. John 12, 49, 50. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me, he, the Father, he gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command, that of the Father, is everlasting life. Therefore, whoever I, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. Now, interestingly, when we look at the word Father, it's repeated in the Bible. Many times, the same word, and I can show you some of the Greek later, is used for other than God, meaning it's a term of respect. Just like the word Son, people talk about, the, the verse in John also mentioning Jesus being the begotten Son is used for other than Jesus. So these terms are not to show literal relationships, rather they are terms of endearment, right? We do not believe as Muslims that God has a son or a father or an uncle or a brother or a roommate or any of those kinds of relationship. He was never married. You know, we believe God's above all that. And that's something you find in the Bible. If you look in Exodus, and this is in the Old Testament, 4.22. This is in Old Testament, in your Bible. You can look it up if you're a Christian. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, my firstborn. So now if this is to be taken literally, that son here means the physical son, then Israel would be the firstborn of God, and he would be the older brother of Jesus. In fact, in the same Old Testament, this is now in 2 Samuel 7, 13, 14. So 2 Samuel chapter 7, 13, 14. He shall build a house for my name. This is talking about Solomon. It's a reference to David about his son Solomon. He said, he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. Now, obviously, Solomon is not physically the son of God. He's the son of David. Right? And here, it's made very clear that son is a term of endearment. This is not a physical relationship. Now, many Christians may come back and say, well, Jesus is called a begotten son, and that's different. Well, if you're a Christian, open up. The Psalms of David, the book of Psalms, 2, 7. Chapter 2, verse 7. Again, we're not in the New Testament here, we're in the book of Psalms. Here it says to David, again, pre-Jesus here, peace and blessings be upon all the prophets, I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Right? Now this is here, and you can find... Tons of others, like like uh, one of the du'at in the past said, there's sons by the tons. In Jeremiah 31, 9, it says, For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. So we would say that none of these are physical relationships. Rather, they are terms of endearment. Now, many Christians may be surprised when we say, that God above is the greatest. And the rest, whether it's the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, or the Prophet Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him, or the Prophet Abraham, peace and blessings be upon him, or the Prophet Moses, peace and blessings be upon him, are true righteous servants of God. They are the ones that are sent by God, but the greatest is only the one God above. When we say this, Christians can go to their own Bible. In John... You will find chapter 5, verse 18. Therefore G the Jews sought all more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but he also said the, the God 
was his father making himself equal with God. This is where the people made this accusation. But in the same chapter now, if you go further down, it will say that Jesus said to them, I can of myself do nothing as I hear, I judge, my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own. He's clarifying to them. I'm not, clar I'm not putting myself at the place of God. Jesus is saying, my righteous, my judgment is that of God because I do not seek my own, but my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. So again, Jesus is saying that I'm not, when you're making these accusations against me, and this is interesting because many Christians claim the same today that Jesus said he was God when he never did. In the entire Bible, you'll never find anywhere that Jesus clearly says, I'm God. And sometimes people take the verse about I am and we'll discuss that. But here he makes it very clear. He says, I do not seek my, my, my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. If, and this is verse 31 now, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. You know, this, this is in the Bible. So we say Jesus was sent by God, by the Creator as a prophet as somebody who would be the way to get to God, to get to know God. And if we, if we were alive, me and you, Eddie, in the time of Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him, we would be from his followers. We love him. We would follow him. If me and you were alive in the time of Abraham, we would follow Abraham. Peace and blessings be upon him. We love him. If me and you were alive in the time of Moses, we would follow him. As he's the prophet of that time, we love him. Peace and blessings be upon him. Mm -hmm. But we are in the last prophet's time, in the time of the prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. And that's why we are the followers of the prophet Muhammad. But we love all of the prophets and we say peace and blessings be upon all the prophets. Absolutely. I want to ask you about this before we get into Tyrese here. You have three possibilities. If there's a fourth, let me know. When you use the word son, in the English language, you can have an adopted son, mm -hmm. a physical son, or it's something met left to be a metaphor. A metaphor term of endearment, as yeah, you would say. Right? So it's uh, metaphorical, right? What in this case would we say is this term referring to? Adopted, physical, or a metaphor? This is We would say for sure it's a metaphor, a term of endearment. Yeah. Because, like I mentioned... And that makes sense. It just, yeah. It makes I mean, look... For example, if somebody says Jesus didn't have a father, right, born miraculously, we would say neither did Adam, neither did Eve. In fact, in the Bible, if you look at the genealogy of Jesus, right in the beginning, and in, in you have it in Matthew, and you have it in Luke, right? If you go through the one in Matthew, it begins with Abraham. If you go through the one in Luke... And again, I don't claim to be a Bible scholar. I'm just somebody who actually reads the Bible. So if you go to the, uh, the genealogy in Luke, it will say, Now Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age, being a supposed the son of Joseph. It goes on to take each genealogy. In Luke 3.38, it ends with the genealogy going back to the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, who is the son of God. So here, just like uh, Seth is called the son of Adam, and Enosh is called the son of Seth, Adam is called the son of God. Well, that doesn't mean Adam is physically the son of God, even though Adam had no father and had no mother. But this is a term of endearment. Mm -hmm. right? So we would say that just like when you walk up to somebody and say, son, let me speak to you. Come here, son. If somebody is close, you're showing endearment, you would say son. Just like somebody goes to a preacher or a pastor or, or a, a priest in the Catholic Church and says, Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. What well, doesn't mean literally that's their father. It's a term of respect. Yeah. Some people can take uh, this the wrong way. Some people can really take to it um, in a loving way and be very thankful that you're pointing these things out. It's kind of like the person is a fair assessment who... Does the DNA test if yeah. uh, because you could be invested in a person? Let's say you have a person and he grew up uh, 
you, you, you grew up believing he's your father, and then mm. someone comes and brings a DNA test, he's actually not your father. He is not the father. So now, it's like, do you shoot the guy who just brought this information to you? Or, I know you're heavily invested in it, mm. or do you go ahead and open your mind and say, hold on, this is just the first part of the quest of the journey for truth. Let me dig a little bit deeper. Let me ask the Creator, God Almighty, to guide me throughout this confusion. Right. And many have done this, and they have grown but some people they get stuck on certain traditions following their ancestors and parent people blindly and they just want to be stubbornly holding on to things and we're just uh, bringing this to light respectfully we got into it yeah and i want i want to get into um i do want to mention one thing ahead. before you go forward um if you're a christian and you're watching understand we mean this with the utmost of respect we mean this having studied the bible as you can see my bible is filled it's not something we do out of uh, ignorance of the text if you're a christian go to matthew take your bible out 26 39 matthew 26 39 and it says he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed jesus peace and blessings be upon him according to the christian bible he prayed saying oh my father is it possible to let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Just think about that. If Jesus was God, right, which is what the church tells us, fully God, while on earth, according to the Christian doctrine today, the standard you find in Baptist and uh, Protestant churches and so on, including Catholics, Jesus on earth was fully God. Fully human, fully God, which makes no sense to me anyway. But, but just think about this. Why would God be praying to God? He didn't pray to himself. And why would he tell God that, take this cup away from me? I, I mean, if you're a Christian, just think about this. Who was he praying to? Meaning, uh, take this cup away from this hardship, whatever I'm so going now, through. So how, now, how would that? Now, yeah. if the plan was for Jesus to come to the earth, and be killed for the sins of mankind, then why would he ask God to take it away from him? Take this test away, this trial. But, but that, that would be the plan then. Yeah. Why would he tell God, why have you forsaken me? Who was he praying to? Do you ever see in the Bible the Father praying to the Son? Yeah. Or to the Holy Ghost? You do see Jesus many times. Now, if you say that's because he was on earth, then you would have to then admit that at that time he was no longer God. Now, now, now that was from Matthew twenty six thirty nine, right? Yes. But can you use the same same thing in when he's on the cross and he's saying, "Ila ila sabah right? my God, my God, why have you forsaken me?" Exactly. If, if you're getting into okay, this is a plan that he's coming to die for your sins, but you just gave one example. You can connect it with this. Doesn't seem like they're on the same page then with a plan. He's no. I'm going to mention one more, even though I wasn't going to, but just for yeah. fun. And this is uh, Mark 13.32. Mm -hmm. And if you're a Christian, pull out your Bible, read it. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Now, that's a very important point to take here. It doesn't mention the Son on earth. It doesn't say, mention before, after resurrection. Generally, it says of the hour of the return of Jesus, that's what it's re referring to, nobody knows, not the angels, and it specifies nor the Son, but only the Father. If you're a Christian and your church is telling you that Jesus is God, He is the same God, the Father, the same God above, think about that. Sure. How can God know and not know at the same time. Mm -hmm. Either God, as we see in the Bible, knows everything. That's a quality of being God, that He knows everything. Or He doesn't know. And here it clarifies the Son does not know. Only the Father. And if the church tells you that, oh, He hid that knowledge away from Himself when He humbled Himself, okay, but then He wasn't God. At that time, He did not know. And if the Father knows, He is superior, He is greater than Jesus. They cannot be the same. We as Muslims love Jesus, we respect Jesus,
peace and blessings be upon him, you will never see a Muslim disrespectful towards the Prophet Jesus, but we don't worship him. We worship that same God that Jesus worshipped. Mm -hmm. And if us worshipping the God of Jesus, the God of Muhammad, the God of Abraham, peace and blessings be upon all the prophets, makes us wrong, then Jesus would be wrong, if that's what people say. Because we're worshipping the same God that Jesus worshipped. We're praying to the same God that Jesus prayed to. Mm -hmm. So if you're a Christian, why not pray to that one great creator, the God above, that Jesus prayed to, that Abraham prayed to, that Moses prayed to, that Muhammad prayed to. Peace and blessings be upon all of them. Yeah, this is a very common sense. A lot of the points you're bringing up and you're bringing the evidence. And can you say that uh, before we go into the Tyrese here, because he talks about Jesus also, and we wanted to touch upon that, is the point that when you translate things, you heard the term lost in translation. True. I remember when I had a guest on, he was a deacon, former deacon, Dr. Gerald Dirks. I don't know if you heard of him. He finished uh, from the Divinity School of Harvard. I think and I saw him on your show. Yeah, he was here with us. May Allah grant him Jannah. He's passed away since. Oh, and when he went into the language and looking at son, son of God, when you get into the Aramaic and whatnot, he said, and this was a Bible scholar, he's an academic, he said, that you can actually translate this and they translate it to son, but slave or servant of God. Mm, very interesting. Yeah, so a right. lot of these things now de developed and now we're translating things from a language. Now you mentioned uh, where most, most of these were in the New Testament. As we well, spoke of before, this is now in Greek, in a language that Jesus didn't speak. He did not. He spoke he, Aramaic. 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 And, and the followers of, of Jesus, peace and blessings be upon were Aramaic how, speakers. How much does it play into Greek being with all of the pagan culture and they're oh. taking, they have already sons of gods. And also, one thing I find interesting is people, most pastors and preachers, if you're Christian and you go to a, a minister, ask him if he speaks Kone Greek and if he's fluent in reading and understanding. Mm -hmm. Most of them are not. Muslim scholars and students of knowledge and people who study, almost all of us, the first thing we do is we learn Arabic. Myself, I'm not Arab, but I learned Arabic. And Nahu and Sarf and Balagha, I studied the Arabic language because I wanted to study the Quran in its original language. Now, interestingly, I have a interlinear Bible, Greek and English. And it's a very interesting one I got. It's four volumes. The first three volumes are Hebrew English for the Old Testament. And the fourth volume here is Greek and English in the, uh, in the, for the New Testament, because the New Testament was in Kone Greek. Now, there is a verse we find very commonly used to say that Jesus is God. And this is something many Christian preachers, they will, they will come out and say, you know what, Jesus said, I am. And this is something, uh, kind of a, um, a play on the language, as you were saying, being lost in translation that they use, where they will say, that in in the Old Testament, God says that He is Yahweh, meaning He is or I am, right? But that's a Hebrew word, and they try to bring out uh, ego imai, Greek word now, Greek word now, and make them mesh to now. make it say that ego imi means I am. So Jesus is the same God of the Old Testament, and. What the, the verse that they use here is in John um, 8.59, right? 8.59, where uh, then which they took up stones. So right before that, 8.58 is where it begins. Jesus says, Truly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Ego imi. Here, the Greek, and this I have with the Greek and English lining up, is used to say that this is a special name of God, ego imi, I am. And because Jesus said, I am, that means he's claiming to be God. Of course, now, the word God, as used for the Father repeatedly, could have been used, but it's not. Eh? They, they make up this idea that this is a clear statement. But if you just read the same chapter, same John, you just go about 10 verses further, you go to chapter 9, and you go to verse 9, 
it talks about the blind man. Chapter 9 begins talking about uh, a man who was blind. And uh, through the, the dua or the supplication of the Prophet Jesus, Allah granted him sight. But interestingly, the same discussion goes on when the people ask about who he is. Who was the blind man? Because he can see now. And that man says, Ego imi. The exact same Greek word. I mean, if you just go a few verses further, you will find the exact... Now, if that's a special name of God, as Christian preachers claim, that I am, Ego imi, in Greek, is a special name that God had for himself, then the blind man must have been God, <laughs> according to that logic, because he says exactly, and he stops there, this is a full stop, ego imi, that's it. The mistake made here, and again, I can show you many others who have used the exact same name. For example, if you go to Luke, and this is the New Testament, if you go to Luke 1, 19, you will find Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, he will say, ego imi. And this is in Luke 1, 19, he will say that, Gabriel says that I am exact, the exact, same I am. exact same Greek the, the wording. The angel Gabriel is saying I am. I am, exactly. And you will even find in Matthew, same thing being used by Judas. When he's saying that not I am. Judas, the, Judas, betray the, the betrayer. The betrayer of Jesus. Yes, when he's, when he's trying to be uh, cunning, that he's not the one, he uses ego e me. I actually looked up, uh, many uh, Greek dictionaries and I went back and I spoke to people who are scholars in the Greek language and what it is is ego imi is a statement that I am the one you're referring to I'm the one you're referring to that the subject matter is me so when they talked about who's the Messiah Jesus is saying it is me I am the one that was sent to you that before Abraham even was I was assigned as the prophets have been given their jobs Prophets have been chosen by Allah, right? Not that he existed at that time. Even the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he said he was given the prophethood when Adam, even Adam, was not created yet, right? So, it what it's saying is that I am the one you're talking about. So it's like God Almighty, Allah, in in His ultimate knowledge, infinite knowledge, He's prescribing things before even the creation. Everything's course, written, so it's laid course. out. And no doubt to that. Now, if this was a special name, as Christians claim, then when it's used by the blind man about himself, mm -hmm. does that mean that the blind man is God? When Gabriel uses it for himself, does that mean that he's God? When Judas is saying, not me, is he talking about not being God? No, it is saying, I'm the one that you're talking about. I am. I am the subject matter that you are discussing. And that's why it's the exact same word, in Greek is used repeatedly. But the problem is, pastors and preachers and ministers, to try to support their own dogma, they hide the actual verbiage from the people. Mm -hmm. They say God had this word, Yahweh, which is Hebrew, <laughs> and then they try to translate a Greek name and say, this is a special name, and Jesus saying that I am means that he's saying he's God. No, he's not. He could clearly say, I'm God. That's not difficult. Right? He's never, no, never, never, ever. In fact, he says continuously the says, the Father is greater than I. Right? I'll show you something very interesting. In the Greek, um, and this was why, again, I don't claim to be a scholar of anything. I'm just a student of knowledge. But I do like to read. So I went and I looked at a verse that comes in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And this is verse 6 where they talk about what they said. They said, but for us is only one God, the Father, the above, the one above, to whom all things, and we have for him one Lord, Jesus. They clearly separated Theos being used and Krios as Lord. So they separated a different word saying there's only one God above and one representative or a lord or somebody that was sent that is jesus right and this is something you can if they're the same if jesus god and the holy spirit according to the idea of the trinity are the same they, why are they clarifying two different words right look 
even if we just go to the very basic, simple English, you will find that repeatedly Jesus says, there is only one God. This is eternal life, that they may get to know you, the only true God. Right? This is something that that's we find. One, that's uh, John 17.3. 17.3, exactly. I'm gonna that is such a powerful verse right there. Yeah. It's a very common sense verse. It's a verse that you don't have to kind of oh, do too I mean, much thinking look, about. It's straightforward. If you're a Christian, open up your Bible and go John 17.3. And this is eternal life that they may know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I call this the Shahada. The verse. Shahada verse, Doesn't right? Doesn't it sound like now, this? It this does. It? This is exactly what we say. We say that there is one true God, the one above, the one that's created everything, the one that's always lived, the one that never dies, the one that knows everything, the one that was worshipped by Abraham and Moses and Jesus and Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon them. And that God sent Jesus, that God sent Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon both of them. Now, some of the Christians will come back and they will say, well, Jesus said, me and the Father are one. Right? Now, if that is taken to mean that they are physically one, then the same chapter, John 17, keep reading to verses 20, 21. John 17, 20, 21. According to the Christian Bible, and if you're a Christian, take out your Bible, read this. According to Christians, Jesus says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, the Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. You see here, when Jesus says, me and the Father are one, this is referring to the same mission, being on the same page, that God sent Jesus, not with his own ideas, but they are one. Just like, for example, Eddie, we might say we're one nation, under God, right? In America, we say this. We don't mean that we're all physically the same person. We're one family. We're one family. We're one in purpose. We're one nation, one tribe, one people, yeah. one love, all these things that we use. Just like Jesus is saying that just the same as me and the Father are one, mm -hmm. the disciples are one, and those that believe in the Word are going to be one in us. That doesn't mean they're physically the same. These are things that we hope that our Christian neighbors and our Christian co-workers and others that are out there will think about. And many people are. Today you see brothers like Andrew Tate and Sneeko and others that come from that Christian background when they realize these things, they've accepted Islam. Mm -hmm. And there are many more. Inshallah, our brother, uh, young Don, who's studying right now, we're having conversations. Inshallah, you will see, I hope from Allah, that Allah guides him to Islam. That today, young Don even has rejected the idea that Jesus is God. He's not the one God above. He's making that progress. And we hope that others that are watching this w will think about that. The one God that has always lived can't be killed. He can't not know. He can't be tricked. He can't be fooled. That is the creator of everybody. That is the God that knows everything. Saying God was fully God and fully human is like saying there's a square circle. It just doesn't make sense. People are like, can't God do everything? It's not that we're restricting God, but think about that. If you're a square... You have four corners. That's the definition of a square. And if it's a circle, you have no corners. That's the definition of a circle. If you put corners, it's no longer going to be a square, circle. And if you put it to be with no corners, it cannot be a square. It's going to be a circle. God knows everything. And if he doesn't, he can't be God because that's not what God is. God is ever living. If he's killed... He's not God, because that's not who God is. And if somebody doesn't know, they cannot be God. If somebody is killed and tortured and beaten, they cannot be God, because God is above that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, if the mind's open, if someone's really trying to um, get to ascertain the truth, I mean, this is brought to you with 
love uh, because we love for humanity what we love for ourselves so we're trying to go ahead and uh, share let's get into um, Tyrese he was someone who brought a lot of attention when he was visiting the Dubai hmm. and it seemed like he was really close to accepting Islam I mean, Allah guide him I mean so something came up recently and we wanted to go ahead and maybe reissue an invitation to him and also kind of uh, break down and get a reaction to some of his statements from this video here. Yeah. It's all God, right? Because, you know, we're, we should, as believers, we should go the rest of our life trying to figure out God. That should be an everlasting hunt. I just feel like we're in competition right now because they are trying to normalize the devil. They are trying to populate. The devil is, is on the main stage at award shows. And in every video and yeah, man. signs and symbols. And I said, you know what? We need to stop treating our relationship with Jesus like the little buddy that you talk to before you go to bed at night and not be more vocal about all the things that God means to us and all of the things that God has brought us through. Yeah, they going above and beyond to promote the devil. And it's pissing me off. Mm -hmm. Because they, they, they used to, devil worshippers used to be real secretive. Oh, like yeah. going down in the basement, this yeah, secret man. world. Now they just Now like, they on the ah. device too. Yeah. What do you think? I like how we start, started off being in an everlasting hunt. Yeah. If uh, somebody wants to know what the purpose of life is, why they've been creative, they got to seek to, like there's a hadith, uh, I'll paraphrase that. God Almighty Allah is saying that all my slaves, servants, they're misguided unless I guide them. So ask Absolutely me of God. my guidance. Does and it start from there? You. That's beautiful, yes. Now, I think that's a great point to make here that those that worship the devil, whether they do it openly or secretly or whether they do it explicitly or otherwise, have been coming out of the closet, you could say. You saw, you've seen in, that, right? In more Good ways time. than one. Um, it's becoming more so evident. You've seen it all uh, over, right? We're seeing it everywhere. And, you know, in fact, what I'm, I'm not surprised with Hollywood. I'm not surprised. I, I think Hollywood and a lot of other uh, such um, institutions were meant to misguide people, meant to to dilute the masses. What I am most shocked about are the churches. Mm -hmm. You know, now, today when I was driving over here, um, I was, you know, uh, I saw a Methodist church and it was huge Methodist church and it had a huge rainbow flag on it. And, you know, it was, it was there supporting that LGBTQ, XYZ, infinity sign, whatever lifestyle. And that's something shocking to me because that is something we could not have imagined. But those that want to promote such a lifestyle have now tried to normalize it to the point that even churches, even the Pope has become soft on these issues and is accepting. And because of the church not having a backbone, not having enough guts, enough courage to stand up what's in their Bible, now you're seeing devil worshippers, as mentioned by Tyrese there, out in the open. You see them flaunting their disrespect for God, disrespect for religion, disrespect for anything holy, and they're telling you very clearly, we're coming for your kids. Now, no, there's a clip you can play. Yeah, I've shared that, yeah. You can see where he talks about, we're here, we're queer, we're coming for your kids. They're saying this in pride rallies, openly. It's, it's not something hidden. And there is a kid, you can see that one from Kentucky, 11-year-old kid being given a book in his school that is promoting and explicitly pushing such immoral homosexual behaviors that even if that was a heterosexual behavior being described, that would not be acceptable for an 11-year-old to be given from school. But this is an agenda that has now come in full focus. And we as Muslims, alhamdulillah, are the ones standing up against it. You see churches falling. I want to read to you something from the Bible about this. And if you're a Christian and you support the LGBT flag or your church has it on there, or you try to say that this is their business, I want you to go and open your Bible. Now again, I'm going to read from the Old and the New Testament. And before anybody says, oh, the Old Testament... This is the Old Testament. If you're a Christian 
and you believe in the God of Jesus, then he's the same God. If you believe Jesus is God, then these are the laws Jesus ordained. If you believe in the God of Jesus, this is the laws of the God of Jesus. This is in Leviticus 20, 13. Leviticus chapter 13, chapter 20, verse 13. If a man lies with a male as he lies with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. This is the Bible. This is the Bible. It's not the Quran. This is the Bible. Old Testament, Leviticus 20, 13. Now, I do want to clarify something that I am not saying that this is something that people need to take into their own hands or anything like that. I'm just reading scripture from the Bible that Christians do give out and claim is the words of God. Now, somebody might say, oh, you know, that's the Old Testament. Well, even if we go to the New Testament, if we go to Romans, you will find the same penalty being used f in the New Testament. N and before I bring it up, I do want to make a point that if you're Christian, live by your text. You know, either you can say that this is the words of God, this is what we live by, and this is what we're going to stand by, fine. Or you can say, you know, I'm not Christian, I don't believe in the Bible, fine. But you can't claim to be preaching the Bible, you can't claim to be living by the Bible, and at the same time violating the rules that are in your book. We as Muslims, we live by the Qur'an. We're proud of the Qur'an, we love the Qur'an, we don't, we don't compromise on the Qur'an, we're not apologizing about anything, we're not compromising on anything, we're not watering down anything. That's how we are. Now, this is the New Testament. In case somebody tries to say, oh, that's Old Testament. This is in Romans chapter 1. If you look at verses 27 through 32. In 27, it says, Likewise, also the men leaving the natural desire and use, or the natural use of the woman, burnt with their lust for one another, men with men committing that which is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which is due. Now, what is that penalty? You will see in the same chapter going down in verse 32, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also those that approve of that practice. Now, this is in the Bible. This is the, Bible. This is the New, New Testament. Testament. Romans 27 to 32. The Bible says, now again, if you're Christian and you believe this is the Word of God, then why do you not live by it? So it's, all you're asking the question is, why don't you adhere to the book? That's it. The Bible says that those who commit such actions and also those who approve of it is an abomination. Deserve death. This is in the Bible. This is in the Bible. Once again, for political purposes, I'm making it clear. I'm not giving my own views. I'm not telling anybody to take into their own the law into their hands. I'm just saying this is for educational. This purposes. is educational purposes in the Bible. That's what it says. So, what Tyrese is mentioning and what I find disturbing is the followers of the devil are now coming out of the closet. They're coming in the open. They're pushing their agenda. And people are not standing up to it, except for Muslims, alhamdulillah. The Muslims, we're open, we're clear about our stances, about our condemning the practices that are devilish, the practices that are unnatural, those that pro support or promote and, and push this LGBTV on kids. This is something that we condemn. Churches are putting up rainbow flags. Churches are out there in the pride parades. You see pastors and preachers marching with, with, with those that are wearing leather outfits and they're taking little kids. I mean, you can see these videos online. If, if heterosexuals were doing such disgusting things, I wouldn't put kids in that parade. But having people who are practicing the practice of the people of Sodom and Gaborah that they were cursed by God in the Bible, those that the Old Testament and the New Testament clearly condemn with death and pastors and preachers are out there dancing popes are out there trying to soften their stances why because these churches have sold out they have been bought 
with money by the by the people who have their devilish agenda and that's why people like Tyrese are upset they're seeing that the people of God are not taking a stand but we as Muslims are and our brother Andrew Tate as you know one of the reasons he came to Islam is he said this is the only religion left today this is the only people that take the religion seriously they're the only people that stand for anything Alhamdulillah, and we ask Allah to protect us and keep Ameen. us firm and not let us sell out like those that want us to sell out. Uh, do you think something like a way of life that is accepted by God, it's in the Quran, it's in the Bible, uh, do you think they would promote it? And there's a ton of evidence for it, via, uh, like they do these, um, what's against the Bible, against the Quran, polygyny, for instance. What do you think if they were educating humanity on how a man can have multiple families, take care of them, of not sexual or anything, but just show how it can actually work, how it can benefit society? Well, that's the funny thing. If you, if you look at polygamy, um, you will find it throughout the Old Testament. You, you will find reference to those same prophets, like David in the Old Testament. You see him having many, many wives. See... Uh, Solomon for example and you'll see others and you will find the same people praised in the New Testament for example David he's called a prophet in the New Testament so that lifestyle was the natural lifestyle of the people of God it was not condemned until you see Romans and their influence coming in so that there being something that would help humanity to be honest right meaning if you look at it just from a, a perspective of nature, take it back, right? We're not even talking about religious texts. If there is a man and he marries a woman and they have children, the human species furthers. It goes on. Now, whether he has one wife or he has two or three, human species goes further. It moves on. Now, if a man marries a man or a woman marries a woman, what happens here? They don't have children. The human species doesn't or create it doesn't go forward now if that becomes a trend if that becomes common the human species ceases to exist and this is a very dangerous thing i mean people don't realize this but many european countries are having loss of population and even though they speak bad about immigrants they're only surviving because of immigrants because one the heterosexuals of that society are not having children. They're too worried about partying and living it up. And the homosexuals obviously cannot have children. So society is starting to fall apart. You know, you need, as some studies have said, 2.3 or, you know, 2.5 or whatever, but more than two children per man and wife for a society to, to survive. Just to survive. You need more than two because some children will die, you know, and so on. Now, if you start to say men are marrying men and women are marrying women, here, those cannot now reproduce. They can adopt, but then they're adopting from a heterosexual, right? So you look at the, the fact that humanity is in danger if these lifestyles become prevalent. It's something people don't want to talk about. When polygamy, for example, would help humanity grow, right? So... People don't use the same standard. People don't want to talk about the Bible. They don't want to talk about religious sex. They don't want to even talk about the betterment of society and the, and the survival of the human race. They just want to ask you, what are your pronouns? You know? mm -hmm. And, you know, this is something insane. If you're heterosexual or homosexual, you need to thank heterosexuals because you're even here. If it wasn't for us who have the natural way of life, Humanity wouldn't be here. We don't even dis uh, get to the point where we're dividing people based on their sexual preferences in Islam. You notice that? Mm. It, you, you get what I'm saying? That, right. that now, I mean, these are your, obviously there's what's haram, what's halal, what's haram. Of course. Now, Islamically, are, they, are there these categorizations about the, the way they've divided people into... Uh, no, 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 in Islam... We don't have any of this uh, insanity about trans and what gender do you think you are. And that, no. We know that Allah, the God, the creator of the universe, created us as men and women. That's right. It. And there is a natural method. If you're alive right now, if you're alive right now, 
it's because a man and a woman came together, right? Yeah. You you could not be surv- alive right now if it wasn't for that. That's what we go by. This is the natural way. Now, some people may have feelings or inclinations or desires that are not the same. Meaning, somebody might be attracted to a wall or a monkey or their sister. You know, and if you say love is love, then why is incest strong? Right? We say no. There is a moral code. There is a natural way that was ordained by the Creator above, and that's what humanity is lived by. Whether you go to the Old Testament or the New Testament, or you go to Hinduism or this or that, you will find that men, women, get married, have children. That's how society works. And these are not our opinion. This is from divine revelation. Once again, we that, are simply... And this is a freedom of religion that the Constitution well, allows for people I to I mean, the first off, we are simply reading from the text, not just Muslim texts, but from Christian, yeah. Jewish, Old Testament, New Testament texts, what those texts say. We have to, as people of conscience, as people of morality at least be able to state our view. You know, if people have the right to insult others and burn Qur'ans and make uh, cartoons inciting hatred, why can't we as Muslims just state Quote the text. what? Not just our text. We're in line here with, with the, the Old Testament, the New Testament, the and text, the Qur'an. With the Christian text and the, the Muslim text. But, we, but they want to scare us by being cancelled. They want to mute us. And we cannot allow that. The First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States allows us to have these views and express them. Yeah. Just moving along to what he was saying, a few other things. It's interesting as a musician, him also pointing out the symbols and the music and the messages that are in there that are dangerous, these satanic messages. I actually recently did a breakdown of uh, a documentary that really goes into deep, the black magic behind mm-hmm. all of the, the music, how they use these musical instruments and you know these musicians, and then they put the poison in there and they put all this to get into you. Because naturally, if you're listening by to the lyrics by themselves, yep. it's not going to get in you. But then next thing you know, you got... The woman singing, she's a hoe, Na- naturally, n- normally she wouldn't, but the beats right. got into her and now she's like degrading herself. Well, you know, uh, I mean, I- if you look at the music industry, and I know many brothers that were involved in it, or in to some extent or the other, that got out of it, it is a very devilish industry. And some are very open about it. I mean, uh, we have a brother that used to be with us in San Diego that was a professional model, and he spoke about uh, himself and his interactions in Hollywood and also his wife who used to be a, a makeup model, uh, you know, on, I don't know, on TikTok or Instagram or something like that. And she was offered some uh, opportunities in Hollywood. And I have an interview that I did with him that's on our One Message Foundation channel. And he talked about where they took her to go to worship the grave of other people, to, to do satanic rituals. These are not things that are hidden but people outside the industry may not know about it. But these are well known. I mean, from very early on, Jimi Hendrix and so on, you found uh, relationships with the devil. If you look at Ozzy Osbourne and so on, you saw their relationship with the devil. Uh, Tupac spoke about it. He spoke about the industry and their devilish tendencies and how he was, you know, uh, kind of on the outskirts because of it. Um, as a comedian, Cat Williams, he, he spoke about uh, a lot of the uh, rituals that they have, homosexual rituals that he witnessed himself. Um, David Chappelle spoke about it. Uh, you know, a lot of these people who run Hollywood, who run the music industry, are involved in the LGBTQ XYZ lifestyle. They are people who clearly and openly worship the devil. They're involved in satanic rituals, whether they're doing it through the Mason temples or whatever else i mean i'm not a conspiracy theory guy i'm a facts guy and these things are facts i mean there are people who will tell you what they saw people that were involved in that lifestyle um, you know even if you look at uh, professional le- wrestlers you know he used to be called wwe or w- now it's called w- wwf wwf right um 
you know, there's uh, Rowdy Piper, I believe he was. Yeah, we, Rowdy, Rowdy Piper. Yeah, we grew up watching him. Big buff guy, you know, mm-hmm. tossing people around. And he was molested. He was made to do homosexual acts. To be, and I mean, you wouldn't think, you look at these big, strong guys, but that industry is such a devilish industry. And he gives an interview and he talks about it, you know, um, which tells you we need to be very careful as Muslims or, you know, even if you're a Christian or Jewish or just a person of conscience, you need to be very careful what your kids watch, what you watch, what you listen to, what your kids listen to, because there is an agenda there. And that mm. agenda is becoming more, as Tyrese mentioned here, is becoming very out in the open. They're becoming more and more aggressive with that devilish agenda. And you've had a lot of uh, musicians also come out that and talk about how with the different beats and everything that they use, that th- these are tools that the devil uses mm-hmm. to bring him to his way. Yeah. To put you in a trance, to put you in a different w- There was a concert. World. Just um, like you have the Quran. People heal the hearts with the Quran. Yes. Right? It's through words. Shifa, yeah. It's, yes, a healing. Mm-hmm. But with these uh, instruments and this music and these symbols, all these things, these are the tools of the devil, the shaitan. This is what many of these uh, musicians are even coming out and saying. Yeah. There was a concert. I forgot the name. He was a rapper. Uh, and they, I mean, I don't, I don't listen to him, so I don't know. Yeah. But what I read about from the news was people got into this trance like devilish mood where they started stomping and killing and many and he continued people were getting killed with, with these what, ma- mosh pits and stuff nah, it was a rapper um yeah. i don't again because i don't okay yeah yeah i heard it on the news yeah yeah was that little nas or one of those nah, guys somebody knew um yeah. uh, he had like a uh, shoe brand after him too and stuff but but uh but very interestingly he continued playing the music while people were being killed in that crazy frenzy and when i was reading the article the people were like we were out of our minds the devil had taken over our body these were statements by some of the people wow and there was a lot of criticism that he continued playing even though he could see people were being hurt and you know people can look up the article um uh, it's quite it's quite dangerous and it's very Mm -hmm. scary yeah let's move on to um last thing i want to talk about we had it's scheduled to have just pearly on the program actually Mm -hmm. and we ended up they ended up on there adjusting the dates but we wanted to talk about because there was some controversy and people respect the position uh, that she comes out kind of um, talking about some traditional values nice and kind of crushing the feminism that's really gotten and affected a lot of the minds of even the the muslim community male and female yeah yeah so but then she ended up having some questions and they turned into kind of insults and we wanted to see how we can address those sure. and maybe get her to uh, shift if she has some questions because she's uh, had Andrew Tate on her program quite mm-hmm. a while and she doesn't want to inf- offend her guests also, I'm sure. But uh, hopefully we can address this issue because you've talked about it a lot. Mm-hmm. Someone actually sent me, uh, sent us a message regarding this question here i sent your video that you just recently did nice. the person replied and said wow uh they, it was cleared up they said wow this really put a different perspective on it Excellent. so she said she goes to say did muhammad Salallah, so some date a nine year old or not why mm-hmm. is everybody arguing about this he either did or he didn't well, so the answer she was is here. He, she would have been here. How, how would you? Uh, address well, the it? answer is he didn't, because yeah. there's no such thing as dating in Islam, right? Yeah. Um, well, let's just be very explicit and clear. He never dated. He never the had Prophet a girlfriend. Muhammad, peace be upon him, never dated. Never had a girlfriend. Never went out on a date. That uh, dating is not something in Islam. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't know her well. I mean, I, the only reason I know her is because you mentioned her, and a few other people mentioned that you know she is. Uh, kind of the female version of the red pill, meaning that she's going against a lot of things. In, uh, female, that's uh, a female version, version of, the, of, of the, the red pill. Of the red know? pill. For um, our audience, what does that mean, red pill? Uh, well, is? so there is, uh, again, I, I don't support the movement, but there is a movement. Your green pill? Red uh, pill I, I'm green? not any pill. <laughs> any pill. I, don't, I don't touch pills. <laughs> I, I, just, I, I just drink tea. The Islam um, pill. <laughs> I'm Islam pill. Yeah. Um, so basically, uh, there is this 
push for feminism and feminism and I just spoke about this in one of the lectures at Majd al-Haq here in Chicago mm -hmm. um, where this idea originally feminism was to promote things like women's right to own property women's right to be able to work or women's right to uh, you know uh, be able to have their own money and their own uh, lifestyle within bounds right and that's something that Islam already granted inheritance, property, uh, money, own businesses. Uh, Islam had already granted women more than 1400 years ago. So feminism would never have been a thing if people lived by Islam. Those rights would have already been given. Later on, feminism became what I would say feminism on crack. You know, it kind of went offhand. You know, it started to say things like, Women shouldn't be at home. Women shouldn't be raising children. Women should go out there and, 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 and be the same as men. Not equal, but the same, right? And, and that's why feminism has kind of fallen apart. And feminists today are kind of infighting because you have these trans women who are actually men. And now some feminists would say, well, they're women because they, they, they identify as women and they should be playing sports with women. And other feminists are like, no way, these guys are guys. They, they, they will destroy women in sports because physically they're men, right? So now feminists are fighting amongst themselves because instead of being about equal rights and things, it began to be a movement about women not no longer being the traditional role of a woman starting to be a man, right? Where they would encourage things like taking hormones and things to make a woman more manly. And again, that's wrong because you're offsetting the natural method of things. And people in a reaction to this extreme feminist movement was the red pill movement trying to make men um, back to being leaders and manly, but at the same time going to an extreme sometimes um, in their ideas, we as Muslims, we're not feminists, we're not red pillars, we're not, we're Muslim. We don't have to worry about these kind of things because we have a divine truth. We have the Quran, we have the Sunnah of the Prophet والسلام, peace and blessings be upon the prophets. This tells us how to live. What's the role of a man? What's the role of a woman? What's the role of a child? What's the role of a father? What's the role of a neighbor? We don't have to guess at these things. We don't have to argue. We go back to the divine. Our creator knows best how we should live. So we go back to what our creator has told us and we live by that. So the red pill was kind of this movement and we see some, uh, even some Muslim brothers kind of caught up in it. Um, but uh, just pearly or pearly things or whatever. Um, you know, from what I've heard from you and others, you know, she had a good influence to try to do away some of this toxic feminist ideology that was out there. Um, and we appreciate that. Uh, but again, she may not be educated about Islam, so let's educate her. And again, you can welcome her to your show and she can come and speak to you as well. Um, I have a video. If anybody wants to see more details, like you said, if you put Uthman ibn Farooq, age of Aisha, you can see the video and I give a lot of details and things without getting into all of that. Um, Aisha radiyanha, Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her. Amen. She was of age to be married, right? According to the society and customs of the time, there is no doubt because she was already engaged to be married before a woman came to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and suggested her for marriage. This was not something that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was going out and trying to find a wife and look. No, the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, as a prophet of God, he was married to Khadija. Khadija was his first wife. And as long as he was married to Khadija, he never took a second wife. He was happy. She was happy. Great husband, great wife. And no doubt she was older than him. He was married to a woman that was older than him. Now, uh, some people said she was 40, which is not mentioned in authentic narrations. Most likely she was around 25 to 28 at the time of marriage of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. But again, even at that, she would be older than him. So he was married to a woman who was older and they were happy. When she passed away, when she died, then it was suggested to him that there is a woman named Sauda and there is a woman named Aisha and these are women that are 
there at marriage age of the customs of that time. Now, here, I don't know where she got this idea of dating. There was no dating. At that time, there are some narrations that are in Bukhari and Muslim and so on that mention ages. One of them mentions that before, before marriage, that she was at the age of six. Another one from her mentioned that she was seven. Now again, this is not a time of marriage. This is at the time when she was suggested. These are from her herself, right? Now, what I will point out first thing, that this is not mentioned in the Quran. The age of Aisha is not in the Quran. Secondly, it's not mentioned from the Prophet ﷺ. Meaning, what we consider wahi, what we divine revelation, whether Quran or Sahih Ahadith from the Prophet ﷺ, it is not mentioned either one of them. Rather, this was something that she mentioned, and she is an incredibly intelligent, amazing person, great narrator in Hadith, very strong in narration. But again, she's talking about something that she didn't witness. She didn't witness her own birth. I mean, if I ask you, Eddie, how old are you? You don't know other than going back to your passport or your birth certificate or asking your parents. Now, imagine a society where you don't have any of those. You don't have a birth certificate. You don't have a passport. You don't have uh, even the system of years. Right, right now, it's 2023, right? So if somebody is born in the year 2000, how old are they? 23 years old. How do you know? Because they were born in 2000. Now imagine if we didn't have those numbers. How would you know? You'd be like, well, you know that year where it rained a lot? Um, well, 10 years after that, you were born, and then it's been another five years, I think. So you would kind of figure that out in a, in a roundabout manner, right? My own grandmother had no idea when she was born, you know? Um, mm -hmm. You know, she was 14 when she got married. But, you know, she really didn't know. You were guessing, you know. Many people today, if you go to, like, you know, many of our brothers from Somalia that came to the U.S., if you look at their, their passports, they're all born on January 1st. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what happened nine months before January 1st, but somehow, you know, and that's because in Somalia, they didn't really care when you were born, so they didn't record it. So when they came to the U.S., they just kind of made up January 1st, the first day of the year, solar calendar, and they went with that. So... That tells you that keeping ages was not an exact science at the time. And that's why Aisha Radiana herself, in one of the narrations, she says I was six. Another one, she says I was seven. And those are authentic narrations. Again, this is not a criticism of the narrations or her memory. She was amazing. But she's just telling you what other people told her about something that happened before when she was not even in her consciousness, right? But what we do know for sure is that she was at the age of marriage according to society of that time. And they didn't get married at that age. They waited until she was physically capable of handling a married relationship, which is past the age of puberty, when the body naturally tells you, you are ready for marital life. And then they got married, whether that was at nine or older or so on, that was the customs of the time. Now this idea that this wasn't a custom of the time that some people have mentioned is stupidity. They don't study. Why? First and foremost, she was already engaged. So if this was not a custom of the time, then how could she already been engaged? Secondly, nobody objected to it. All the enemies of the Prophet, all those polytheists that were there, find us a single narration where they objected to this being something against the customs of the time. We cannot use presentism. You know what presentism is? When you use present Judging by day the present now. exactly standards to judge the past. Otherwise, if you look at the age of Mary at the time that she was married to Joseph. Now, somebody might say, well, that's not in the Bible. Well, the age of Aisha is not in the Quran. right? But if you look at historic documentation that discusses the age of Mary, you can look at the Catholic Encyclopedia. You can look at many Christian writings. They will say she was either 12 to 14 years of age, marrying Joseph being 80 to 90 years of age. Now imagine today, if a 12-year-old Mary married a 90-year-old Joseph, uh, who would accept that? That would be given all kinds of bad names and so on. But when we mention that, people say, well, 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 well easy there. That was the tradition of the time that women at 12 would marry 80, 90 year old men. Well, okay, if you want to accept that being a tradition of the time, then the age of Aisha was in accordance with the tradition of the time. 
you mentioned also in your talk there was her sister. Yes, Asma radiallahu anha, and she gave other ages, and Ibn Sa'ad and other historians, because again, people don't realize historians didn't really discuss ages like saying, okay, they're this age because they were born in this day. Rather, what they would do is they look at the death dates and they would kind of work backwards because the death dates were better known, right? Because before Islam, there was no calendar. Umar ibn Khattab, the second Khalifa, he's the one that implemented the Hijri calendar. And that calendar is starts from when the Prophet ﷺ, peace be upon him, made the migration from Mecca to Medina. So later, they were able to calculate their lifespans easier looking at the death dates. Looking at that, there are ages given that put Aisha radiha in her teens right, at the time of her marriage. But again, I'm not arguing which one is more authentic and things. The whole point here is that according to the custom of the time, she was already engaged and she was at an age that was acceptable for marriage of that time. Mm -hmm. In our time, even boys, for example, don't get married young. Why? Because they have to go to school and they got to go to high school and then they got to go to college, right? Get a job. But in societies where they don't have that structure, basically when your body is ready, when a woman has hit puberty and a man has hit puberty, they're ready to get married. Right, And they waited for her, for her body to be mature and her mind to be mature to an age where she could be married. And that is why they waited for the actual marriage. Right? This is what is important. At that time, people didn't go to school. Right? When a girl would, for example, one of the, one of the ways that you know uh, a girl is ready for that type of relationship is when she gets her menses. Right? This is the body telling you that you are now ready for childbirth. Now, mentally, according to the society of the time, she might not be ready. Right? That's, you don't have to get married. But this is a natural phenomenon. So when a woman is physically ready for her to get married, this is perfectly acceptable. Today, you have many preteens that are out engaging in sexual behavior. Right? You see pregnant teen teenagers. And there's no law against that. There is nobody upset. You know, I used to work at a school called Twain, as a Mark Twain in San Diego, as a teacher's assistant. And there were girls as young as 14, 15 that had already had kids. They used to have a daycare at the school for these, you know, teenager girls with kids. Now, if they're old enough to be having kids and old enough to be having sex, why aren't they old enough to be married? Right? In Islam, we don't believe in premarital sex, right? So, again, Aisha radianha, in accordance to the customs of the time, she was already engaged to be married. Nobody objected to that. She was engaged to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and married to him in an age that was customary of that time. And people want details, we have a video on it. They can look at it for details. So the question is, on what standards are you judging? So if you're judging by the culture, the culture didn't condemn it. If you're judging by the law, any religious law, there's no religious law no. that condemns it. If you're judging by her family, you already mentioned she was engaged to already be mm -hmm. married. So any which way you go, and if you want to compare it to some close to modern times, let's say the founding fathers, were they yes. people who now were yeah. breaking some kind of laws, well, were I they mean, these terms, the derogatory terms, the founding fathers? I mean, for, first off, even if you leave that out, many of the kings in Europe... And you want to go I further mentioned, back, I try to go closer if you go yeah, back. To so let's take it step by step. Many of the kings married women that were six, that were seven, that were nine, and so on. And this was accepted in Europe, right? Past that, skewing forward, if you look at many of the founding fathers, if you find many of even the the well-known personalities and in my in my video i go through details on these they married women that were under age according to our standard of today many of the founding fathers were slave owners if you look at george washington he owned slaves but when we bring that up people say well well that was acceptable at the time well then <laughs> if that was acceptable at the time and you want to put him on the dollar bill on mount rushmore saying that you know he was acceptable by the time of today it's not acceptable, then that's presentism, right? Then no problem. But then you need to use the same rule. If you look at the Bible, and if you and we can do a, a breakdown of actual verses that will take you over the age of Rebecca when she's married to Isaac, according to the Bible, she was three years old. Rashi, the famous commentator, 
uh, of the Old Testament, he says that this is Jewish law, that a girl past three years of age can get married, right? Now, again, I'm not saying that that's right or wrong. I'm just showing that if you're going to talk, if, if you're going to, purposes. if you're going to criticize, you better look at your texts, right? If you look at some of the states now, even to this day, I mean, if you go further back, I think it was uh, 18, nine, something around there. Delaware was seven. I think in the 80s. In the 80s, they raised the age. S yeah. Um, but until then. But it was uh, as low as seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah. And you go back. In some states, uh, and I, I went over this in my video, till today, at I think it's 10 or 12 years of age, with parental consent, they can get married. Yeah, so the further uh, back you go, you had more traditional values being upheld. You yeah. didn't have this whole institution of schooling, university, and then not to talk about the lifespan. All these things you take into of consideration. Mm -hmm. And also the, the maturity level was nowadays you have some women can't boil an egg. Well, I mean, some men, men, men. the 30, 40 year old guys are still play, sitting there playing, playing video Nintendo. games. Some, some men. And, and they're not, they're not, they're mentally less than 12 years of age. Exactly. So, so men and women true. not mature. Uh, these are, if you, if you just, can you imagine if you look at someone, you know, I was looking the other day, what was he, 19 years old? Uh, Mehmed. Was it Mehmed the Conqueror? Yeah. 19, was he 19 yeah. years old? He was a general opening up Constantinople. Well, Muhammad bin Qasim was 17. Uh, Osama bin Zaid was 17. He How do you wrap your mind around that? Yeah, yeah of course. Uh, I mean, not just that. If Even if you look at earlier cultures, people by the time of 12 and 13, men even, had already had children. Like <laughs> today, <laughs> today, I live in San Diego. We're right next to Mexico, right? If you go into Mexico and you go to inner Mexico, not just Tijuana and Juarez, if you go inside, if you go to some outskirts of Sinaloa and Guadalajara, you will find 14-year-old girls that are married and have kids, right? Now, that may not be acceptable by our standards in the U.S. You have to be whatever age. But that's wrong for us to judge them by our standards. Unless there is something in text, religious text, or in uh, natural development, then yes. But when a woman is at the age that she's having her menses, this is a body telling you naturally she's ready for that type of relationship. And when people are okay with children that age engaging in sexual activity, but not okay with getting married, that's just hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. When you look at men, if you look at some of these, um, I'll take, for example, the Mormons. If you look at, um, mm -hmm. what was the Mormon? Uh, Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith and many uh, like him who later when they get locked up or things get revealed you got women coming out and they're talking about of course uh, all of this all of the different uh criminal things that uh he was doing and the imposter he was and uh, they turn on him basically but that's the amazing thing prophet muhammad peace and blessings be upon him you don't have no such thing from any of his wives now particularly Never. aisha when you look at her, she grew to be a scholar, she somebody did. who would have been abused, somebody who taken advantage of, you would see traumatized. Mm -hmm. uh, they would have um, a totally different mindset, totally be in a different position. But her, you had the companions, the disciples of Prophet Muhammad, they would go behind the veil and get knowledge from her because she was a scholar. She was a scholar. Right? And, and then she, yeah. she praised the Prophet, peace and blessings be That's upon him, saying that his akhlaq, his mannerisms were the best. He was a walking Qur'an, khulqu al-Qur'an. His mannerisms were like as if you see the Qur'an in action. She, she loved the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. She, she continued to narrate hadith, those statements about from the Prophet, peace be upon him, after her, his death, peace and blessings be upon him. And no doubt she became a great example of a wonderful wife, uh, a scholarette, very educated, very eloquent. Till today, if we go back to the books of hadith, where we look at the narrations, or the books of tafsir about the explanation of the Quran, or the books of fiqh about Islamic jurisprudence, I challenge anybody to find a single book of hadith that doesn't have a narration from her, or a single tafsir of Quran that doesn't go to the Quran and not depend on her opinions, or books of fiqh that will mention her opinions, to show what a great example she was and what a wonderful woman she was. She was our mother in the sense that we are the believers. She's our mother. We love her and we respect her. And no doubt that she herself 
praised the life she lived with the prophet peace and blessings be upon him and how wonderful it was and what a great character he was if just pearly if she now i mean she probably agrees would agree with a lot of because because people when you explain islam about worshiping the creator not the creation living a morally upright life all the principles and all the the basics of islam they just make sense yes. now people get stuck on some of these things that need a little more clarification things that might like we explained something is a cult something that's going on 1400 years ago that's the norm and now you want to bring it into today so if someone like pearly she's like okay i just can't wrap my mind i, I agree there's only one god to be worshipped i believe jesus Excellent. is not god but he's a messenger of god I believe that, like she does, that a woman should be feminine, a man should be masculine, all those things. She's like, yes, 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 but now she's stuck here. You talk about this not being a theological thing. It's not and a that, creedal issue. And if she's looking at you and she's like, you know what, this whole calendar thing, maybe she could have been 12. And it's interesting, she says, I can accept 12. <laughs> Well, why can she accept twelve? So if she says, "Look, I want to keep it at 12 I'm gonna. Go to, if I can, I be yeah, a Muslim, and I, I just want to. I want to believe that Aisha was twelve. Look, uh, what do you do? <laughs> the age of Aisha radhiyallahu is not a creed. It's not an aqidah issue. Yes, right. Like I said, even the authentic narrations mentions, uh, for example, engagement when the first happened at six and seven, and other scholars, like I mentioned, whether they're strong and weak narrations and so on, it's not the point. Have given different ages and so on. So that's not really a point of contention to stop somebody from being Muslim. But my question to her would be, why would you accept 12 and not 10 or not 9 or not 11 or not 14? Where did you, wh who draws that line? Who draws that line now? If you mean nature in the sense, if I'm leaving uh, any religious values out of this, in the sense when the body has those signs of maturity, then no doubt the Prophet, peace be upon him, as mentioned in the hadith, waited to consummate the marriage until she was physically ready as natural signs of maturity have come. So then if that's your issue, then you should agree, right? Now, if you make up some number, then where did you get that number from? What's your, like today we say 18. Where did we get 18 from? And if somebody is 17 years old and 11 months are they suddenly not ready for marriage and the next month they are? You see, these are arbitrary numbers we've made up. And like you said, and like I mentioned in my video, if we look at our own history in this country and also in other European countries and other Chinese and African traditions and South American traditions, earlier times when they didn't have schools, they all got married young. That when your body was ready, you got married. And that's exactly 1400 years ago we're talking about. That's exactly what they did in accordance with the customs of that time. And nobody objected to that because that was the custom. She was already engaged. Right? This is something that people don't think about. The fact that she was already engaged to be married according to the customs of the time. And the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, waited for consummation until she was physically and mentally ready for marriage physically and mentally so these exactly. are, that's the criteria of course in islamic jurisprudence if those that study islamic fiqh you will find like in the books like al mughni of ibn qudama and al majmu'a sharh al muandab of al nabawi and others ibn abdul bar uh, they talk about how what is the age and they never give just a break point rather they say that a person who is physically and mentally ready for marriage can get married and there would be women in the past, as Ibn Qudama talks about in Al-Mughni, who would be kind of the physicians of the time. We didn't have doctors or gynecologists and so on that could even go and check to see if a girl is physically, you know, with menses and so on, and mentally ready for her marriage. And then they would permit her to be married. Mm -hmm. Because if we, if we put like an age, you know, women in different parts of the world get their menses at different ages which is a physical sign of being ready for childbirth, right? So if we set an age, how would we use that one number across the board in different cultures, in different time periods? That's why Islam is such a beautiful religion. It's not a religion just for our time or a thousand years ago or a thousand years from now. Rather, it is the truth from the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, till the Day of Judgment. So it has to facilitate all these different time periods in different places. So Islamic jurisprudence, fiqh, tells us that there is no magic number here. Rather, when a woman is physically and mentally ready for marriage, 
according to the urf, the customs of the place, she can get married. Mm-hmm. So we'd ask uh, if you have any questions, ask them, be respectful about it. Sure, okay. and if you can add a link to my video, which yeah. gives you more details yeah, and reference that, all yeah. the books in the description, people can go look up Uthman ibn Farooq, Age yeah. of Aisha, and Google or YouTube as well. And we give you all the details there. So if Pearlie has any other questions, feel free to ask. Feel free to ask. Well, we're here to help uh, you along your way. You were recently also visiting uh, Indonesia. Yes. And it was interesting. You had uh, an experience where people, uh, you, you, you're you starting to see this here. You know, people, it's, it's a shame, you know, parents bringing their kids and you got grown men showing genitalia, you know, it's here. disgusting, but, yeah, yeah. But y- now you talk about that in Indonesia in a certain what village and yeah so I, I had a very interesting experience I mean um, I went from here uh, I went for Umrah and then I went to Malaysia uh, the people of Malaysia are wonderful people had a great time there then I went to Indonesia and the people of Indonesia are wonderful people had a great time there I stopped in Thailand for a day where uh, our brother Bobby accepted Islam and may Allah protect him and Amin, keep him on the right path and then I went back to Saudi Arabia, I did Umrah again, and then came back to the U.S. But one thing I was going to discuss uh, that I found very interesting in Indonesia is there was an area that we went, and this uh, is, is a very, very long drive away from Jakarta. I landed in Jakarta, but I mean, we used to drive like 12 hours, 7 hours, sometimes 20 hours in a day to get to different places. Indonesia is a huge country, um, a beautiful country and wonderful people. Uh, we went to an area that was a very far drive, and in that area, you couldn't go any further in cars. The rest was jungles, right? And we met some people, and these people live, the area they live in is a four-day hike. There is no cars, and there's no roads that can go there. You hike through the jungle. And there's about 800 that, of the population that still lives like this, but they're not Muslim. Um, some of them, the missionaries have come out there. And people talk about, oh, in Muslim countries, missionaries aren't allowed. I mean, in Indonesia, they said there was about 3,000 Christian missionaries from different factions, Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and Catholics and Protestants that were active well, the same time that I was there. And they have open missionary stands where they give out Bibles and so on. But they were out there. And they, they've they also been reaching out to these people. But these people still live like what you would think about Tarzan. And we have footage we're going to be posting as well on the One Message Foundation channel. Um, but you will see that these people, they're cannibals till today. And this was shocking to me. In a country like Indonesia, which is the largest Muslim population, you still have people living like this. They have incest. They have no laws. If you go in their area just as you are, they could just shoot you with an arrow and take your stuff and eat you. <laughs> so, alhamdulillah, we met some of those people. We gave them da'wah. We'll have the videos up, inshallah. And many of them had already become Muslim, and some of them did become Muslim. And when we spoke to them about their lifestyle, it was shocking to me that in today's time, in day and age, modern, present day, uh, there's still people living like this where they live in trees where they ha- they don't even have houses they just make little huts and things within the trees and they live there and they don't have a concept of marriage whoever is forceful can just take a woman and you know what's interesting to me is when i was looking at that i found a shocking similarity to where our society is going now these people were primitive like that they've stayed like that from the old days but as people became more advanced and more progressive and more developed and more educated and more civilized they started to clothe themselves right so these yeah. people till today they walk around naked I mean, they have some things they tie but they could walk around full nudity right and they had no morals of okay, this is incest, this is wrong, this is homosexual, this is hetero, this is you shouldn't kill, you shouldn't steal, right? As people developed, we got away from that and we came to a moral code. No, you need to dress up, you can't walk around naked, no, you can't just sleep with anybody you want, you should get married and this and this, right? But today's society is going back to being primitive. We're getting, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not getting better, 
we're getting worse again. Worse, yeah. Where now we're going back to people walking around naked. We're going back to people not having morality. We're going back to people uh, trying to justify stealing and killing, whether, you know, it's capitalism or big fish eats little fish or whatever else, justifications that we give and promiscuity, um, you know, infidelity, and all those things are being justified today through people trying to take us back to a primitive age. Islam brings us towards being the most civilized. You know, this is why somebody came to me and said, oh, you know, you guys are real primitive because your women cover. And I mean, we cover as well. You don't see me walking around in, you know, tight shorts and things either. So I told this lady, I told her, well, what, what were the cave people like? And she was like, they were naked. And I said, okay, well, what happened when people became civilized? She said, well, people started covering up. I said, then that means we're the most civilized. Our women are the most covered up. Our men are the most covered up. And you walking around, you know, practically naked, you're going, pr you're primitive. You're backwards, not us. You know? And, and, you, and you see that's happening more and more. You see what was at one time, not too long ago, in the 20s, 30s, women had uh, more, even, even, even men. And then of what course. happens now, the, the skirts from below the knee to the ankles, now yep. it's... Uh, 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 just below the knee. Now it's above the thigh, and it just keeps oh, getting less, yeah. less, less. It just now, <laughs> you know, may Allah protect us all. I mean, you look at society, especially in Europe. You see it even worse than the U.S. Um, you know, you have people that have naked runs, like they run around the streets naked. Yeah, and you know, you got little kids, and you got. Things like this, and, and you look at the pride parades and the disgusting things that go on. That's what I can't understand. Parents actually bringing their children to this. You know, I think that should be criminal. Uh -huh. uh, really, I mean, you know, the human mind has certain stages that it develops. And when you expose the child's mind to things that it is not developed for, you will have psychological issues in the future. Yeah. And this is something that psychologists and others will tell you across the board. And when you have people take their little kids to a pride parade where you have men dressed up in leather like dogs and you know doing things to each other i i don't know how any parent can take their children expose them to that i don't know how that's not illegal i don't know how that's not uh, you know against their own moral reality you know and and this is uh, like the video you played earlier of tyrese this is becoming more and more in the public eye more and more common and, and Christians, Jews, even if you're an atheist, but you're a moral person, you need to start taking stances. We're Muslims are standing. You guys need to stand with us mm -hmm. and say, look, this is enough. We can't accept this. This is something that is going to destroy society. Uh, you know, you look at Sodom and Gaborah in the Bible and as well in the Quran about the Qom of Lut salam, and the destruction that it brought. We see our society heading the same way. And we as Muslims who want good for our society, who want to keep this society upon morality, the same morality in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, in the Quran, uh, and other texts as well, are standing up for it. And this is how the societies of the past, uh, the Roman Empire and others, this is what happened when exactly. they started going down this direction. Yes, they were destroyed. The Greek and others too. One thing I want to touch upon, when you're talking to people, there's from uh, one side... They try to create this confusion and this suspicion of Muslims. So they turn, they throw out this term, and when people hear this term called taqiya, mm. now they're like, no matter what you say, they're like, they're just lying. You know, mm. how can we trust them? How would you address this? Well, first of all, uh, people don't understand there is no such uh, practice in Islam. Taqiya is not an Islamic practice. You find this mentioned in some of the Shia, some of the Rafila, some of the uh, books that are mentioned by them uh, in trying to protect their identity they would say it's okay to lie and so on but that's a Shia concept that is not muta'a the temporary marriages taqiyya the lying these are not in Islam they're not in the Quran they're not in Hadith uh, you will not find this in the fiqh and the jurisprudence of Abu Hanifa or Malik or Shafi or Ahmad and so on these are concepts that certain sects may have developed, but they're not mainstream Islamic concepts. You will not find them in the Quran or the Sunnah. Now, if people want to talk about lying and deceiving, you know what, before people get on a high horse, I would say that they need to read the text of their own book. If you look in the Bible, for example, in Second Chronicles 18, 20 through 22, 
This is in the Bible, Second Chronicles, eighteen now, twenty now, to twenty-two. So you're bringing this up now, the Bible, because this usually comes from not all Christians, right? But, but mostly we see Christian some apologists Christians, bringing this concept. They'll up. bring this up, of course. And and, 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 and this was brought up. Uh, I had a conservative uh, Christian. I came on his talk show and he mm. interviewed me. He threw this at me. Mm -hmm. But then I actually referenced, I said, no, this is nowhere in Islamic texts. It is not. I went into what you're allowed to do. Like, let's say your wife cooks you a meal and it doesn't taste good. Even the details that here, you can go ahead and say, it's great, honey. Even though you're lying, right. she puts that's too not, much. That's not taqiyya anyway. No, right? that has nothing to do that, with taqiyya. That's basically that, you know, if there are certain situations, like situations of war. Well, obviously, if you're a general in your war and there's, you know, the enemy is going to ask you, hey, where are your forces coming from? You're not going to tell them. Yeah. That's, I mean, if you look at any country that's been at war, they always want to keep their plan secret. So yeah, in that state situation, secrets, state secrets, of yeah. course. I mean, you know, and, and Hitler and Churchill didn't go around telling their plans to everybody. Like when Muslims saved actually the Jews from Hitler from... Of course. And they were also, hiding them and they were coming. They were actually... Right, um, exactly. Yeah. When they would ask, hey, do you have any Jews here? And they would say, no. This is because they're protecting their lives in that situation. Jews, yeah. Of course. Or, you know, if two brothers are fighting and you bring some sulh, you say, hey, you know what? He's really sorry. Why don't you go talk to him? You're just trying to bring two people together. Yeah. But the concept of taqiyya is not this. Taqiyya is where you're going to lie to defend your beliefs. To advance your beliefs. Right. So. And that is not an Islamic concept. This is why if they're going to bring this, tell them, bring the Quran. Show us where is it. You know, so there was a brother, um, he was new to Islam and he was at the Dawah Center. He was getting educated and he was like, OK, there was a Christian about to come and they were going to do some Dawah and have an educational uh, session. He said, let me even though he was a Muslim, he just started practicing. He says, let me tell him that I used to be a Christian. That might help. And the Muslim teacher said, no, we are not allowed to deceive. This That's is a true specific hadith from the Prophet. Mm -hmm. so, so we don't deceive. Yeah, we're not we deceivers. Yeah. Exactly. You know, um, but if you, if you go to the Quran, for example, even many of the verses that people misquote, like Makaru wa Makar Allah, Allahu Karul Makarin, you look at the context of that is when the people were plotting against the Muslims. And Allah tells them, this is Asbab al Nuzul of the ayah that they have their plans and plots. And that's why every translation you will find that this is for plotting. If you look at uh, Sahih International or Mohsen Khan or all of those, right? And Allah is, is, has his own plans and Allah is the best of planners. No doubt to that. But if you go to the Bible, this is Second Chronicles 18, 20 through 22. It's very clear. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord, before God here, and said, I will persuade him. The Lord said to him, in what way? He said, so he, so the spirit said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. Meaning a, a lying spirit will be placed by God in the mouth of the prophets. The Lord said, you shall persuade him and also prevail. Go out and do so. Lie through the mouths of the prophets. Therefore, look. The Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of these prophets of yours, and the Lord has declared disaster against you. So, so the Bible, according to them, is saying God, the Lord, put a lying spirit in the mouth of their prophets and destroyed a people. We as Muslims never would agree with something like this. Allah does not lie. Allah does not deceive. And He does not allow Muslims to lie or deceive. Taqiyya is not an Islamic concept. What about um, this passage in the New Testament where Paul is saying, if, I'm paraphrasing the, the verse where he's saying, if by, if by, if my lie by gaining people to come to the truth, if my lie by lying I'm able to do that, I'm justified by God. Something that is along. true, right? You and know this passage? Yes, of course. Yeah. I mean, we find in the New Testament where Paul justifies lying in trying to promote his beliefs. This would be taqiyya now. That would be taqiyya. You could say taqiyya. So this in is the, the Bible, hypocrisy. Right? <laughs> trying to throw but that's it. not in the Quran. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. That's not in the Sunnah. That's not in Islam. That is something that Paul and the Shia can deal with. Paul and the Shia. <laughs> so uh, wrapping up here with this part, this is very important. 
because uh, Muslims, some Muslims fell into the to the idea that okay, they have to defend the stakia, meaning that like these things that we mentioned with um, family trying to reconcile between people with the wife example, they think this is uh, this is stakia, but it's not. This ha- we have this nothing not. to do with that. Stakia and Islam have nothing to do nothing with each to other. Nothing to do with that. It's That's not in it. the Quran and the Hadith. So nothing. Not not at all. Okay, a Muslim is one who is truthful. Yeah, and this is why I think honest. people need to be educated before they talk about Islam. When you talk about things like muta'a, the temporary marriage, this was a pre-Islamic practice that was condemned in the Qur'an when the ayat about getting married, nikah, came and who you can have uh, relations with. And it was condemned in clear, sahih, authentic ahadith like that in the sahih of Imam Muslim that is narrated by people from Ahlul Bayt that where Rasul والسلام, forbid the practice of muta'a and even the hadith in Sahih Muslim where he says he forbid it till the day of judgment. Allah, it used to be allowed in the earlier days because of pre-Islamic practice through three stages. It was forbidden in different ways, just like alcohol. There were stages to it. And then the Prophet, peace be upon him, said the practice of temporary marriage is forbidden by Allah. Haram Allah ila al-yawm al-qiyamah until the day of judgment. Mm-hmm. So if somebody tries to bring these things, they need to be educated. These are not Islamic practices. Even if some sects, some breakaway groups may practice them, they're not allowed in Islam. All right, thank you. We covered a lot here. Appreciate the time again, yeah. Eddie. It's always a pleasure seeing you. Alhamdulillah, I'm a big fan. Mashallah. So may Allah bless you and protect you and keep you Ameen. on the right path. Ameen, you How's too. the Deen Center coming? Alhamdulillah, brothers and sisters, we've acquired the future Dean Center property and we want to get the masjid open first. It's all coming along. We're installing the doors. We can make wudu. We've installed the carpets. We have many details to finish up, but it's coming along. Alhamdulillah, we need a new roof. We need new windows and we need a minbar. That's right. We need a minbar for the masjid. Now, if all of you want to be a part of history and help build a house of worship, build a masjid for the sake of Allah, so Allah the Creator can build for you a house in Jannah. Click the link below, donate right now. May God Almighty Allah reward all of you. We're in phase two, alhamdulillah. Allahu Akbar, Akbar. Allah. if you're watching, you gotta support. We're gonna start doing some da'wah trainings out there. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much and thank you guys. If you are interested to learn more about what we're talking about and the book that's changing minds, hearts, and giving you purpose, Go to the website to get you one for free, thedeanshow.com. If you have any questions about what we talked about, call us. Tell them that I sent you 1-800-662-ISLAM, 1-800-662-4762. We'll see you next time here on The Dean Show. Until then, peace be with you. Assalamu alaikum.